Welcome to the Best Business Podcast, the podcast for established marketers, entrepreneurs, and CEOs, the ones who want to join me in my mission to create 200 new multimillionaires who solve world problems with entrepreneurship. If that's you, then this podcast was created to give you access to the tools, training, strategies, and tactics you need to achieve multiple seven-figure profits as soon as possible. This world needs the best business you can build, so please get ready, open your mind, believe you can do this, and let's build a better world together for future generations. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Daryl Urbanski, your host as always, and today we are joined by a very special guest, Dan Gregory. Dan is the founder and host of the Unstoppable Podcast and creator of the Unstoppable Entrepreneur Implementation Program. During eight years as a leader within the corporate world, Dan had the privilege of working alongside hundreds of entrepreneurs, small business owners, and senior business leaders where he began to identify patterns of behavior that either produced success or failure in business. This resulted in an obsessive pursuit for answers to the question, what enables entrepreneurs to win big? His search for answers led him to a defining moment at the back end of the recession in 2012, and he decided to leave his corporate career behind with a huge desire to spread these answers to help more entrepreneurs be successful. Today, Dan works with visionary entrepreneurs who want to disrupt their marketplace, get paid for their ideas, and change the world. Dan's experience, coupled with his unquenchable thirst for constant, never-ending improvement, keep him up to date in what's working for business growth, leadership, and peak human performance. All this combined is quickly making him a highly sought-after advisor to a new generation of entrepreneurs and thought leaders. So I've asked him to join us here today and share what he's learned that we can use to help more people and make more money with less time and effort. So Dan, thank you for joining us. How are you doing, my friend? I'm very well. And Daryl, thank you for the invite. I um, appreciate it. And I honored, it's an honor to be here to serve you today. Yeah, thank you. It's an honor to have you. So um, again, that's a lot of people, they... It's funny because I was actually even thinking about this this morning because I get a lot of people, and I just mean in my immediate circle, not even listeners messaging in, but a lot of people, they don't like don't even know how to get started or if they are up and running, they're kind of confused on like what the key priorities are or like the main levers are in their business and the key leverage points. And so um, I just, I'm actually really looking forward to this discussion today because, you know, it's... I think it's easy to get sidetracked and I think it's easy to kind of lose sight of what really matters. And so I was just looking forward to this. I'm like, wow, this, this is great. I'm really looking forward to hearing from this guy, but obviously, um, you didn't start off as an entrepreneur. You started in the corporate world. So was it just that you hated your job that you wanted to get? Was it the passion? Do you come from a family of entrepreneurs? Like why did you decide to step out and become self-employed? Um, you know what, like versus just try to find some way to do it through the corporate world. That's a great opening question. And um, I really created the unstoppable brand out of my own struggles and my own desire to really create massive change in my own life. And Mm. whilst I was initially very successful in my career, I got to a relatively senior level, Mm. um, having uh, entered directly into the corporate world following my graduation from university um, and had some real successes. But it got to a point where I hit a plateau Mm. and I traveled a lot of work, you know, I was living out of a suitcase, but all the four walls, no matter wherever I went, they all started to look the same. Mm. I'd I'd, I'd lost the passion. I'd lost my mojo in terms of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I developed this concept, which was our performance is capped by our passion. And I'd really lost out on the passion. You know, the first few years of my career, I was all in. People said that my blood ran red with the color of the company's flag. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, But then I just hit that plateau and once I'd realized that, I began to decline and fast. I'd lost all passion for what I was doing, and I felt this huge pull within me to pursue something greater. And I explored all kinds of different career options. I was looking at other corporate routes, but I only really felt one true calling and one path, and that was entrepreneurship. Mm. The reason being, I wanted to be in control of my destiny. I wanted to be in control of my time, my income, and more importantly, my impact. Mm, mm, because mm, mm. as you as you kindly said in the intro, there was a, a defining moment in 2012. And what happened was, is I, I met two different entrepreneurs in the same city, in the same industry, at the back end of this recession. And everyone knows how devastating the recession was. But there was one entrepreneur who was thriving. His business was growing. He was performing exceptionally well, despite all the odds. And the other guy, despite being in the same industry, same city, same conditions, was failing miserably. And it was having this devastating knock-on effect on his employees, his family, and his, and his life. Hmm. And, I, and I sat there that day, and I, I had no authority in my position in that corporate world to, to give any advice that would actually help those entrepreneurs, despite being able to see the difference between the two businesses. Hmm. 
So I got incredibly frustrated. I already lost my passion. And, and this, this was kind of like the final straw. But through my time in, in corporate, I did develop two real passions. One was that relentless obsession of what, what really enables businesses to win big. And the other was a desire to really understand human performance. You know, I'd spent a lot of time managing teams and leading individuals. So these two things together were exceptionally, um, they were big interests of mine. And, and that moment, when I, when I had that day, I knew that I knew the game was up. I had, I, had to, I had to be brave and I had to find the courage to leave my corporate career behind because it's easy, it's comfortable, you know? You've got a salary coming in every month, uh -huh. even if you're not passionate about it. It's, uh, it's, it's a relatively easy lifestyle. But I thought, I'm not here to exist to live an easy lifestyle. I'm here to make a difference. So it was approaching my 30th birthday, and I decided that I wanted to take the hit and go out and make a difference before I hit 30. So a month before my 29th birthday, I handed in my resignation. And I had a, I had a relatively clear idea of what I wanted to create, but I by no means had a full roadmap. And having worked with businesses, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, we demand, from, from, the, from the, my perspective, sat on the other side of the desk, we always demanded these massive business plans. I certainly didn't have one of those. Right. I, I just had a burning desire and a passion to go out and make a difference and help these entrepreneurs succeed, having seen some really real challenges during that time, you know, between 2009, 2012. So I just wanted to get out there and make a difference. That's awesome. So just because you mentioned the big, massive business plan, are you still a firm believer in those big, massive business plans? Is that something you've had to correct or what's your opinion on business plans? This is a total sidebar, <laughs> but it's just because you're cool. interest. Yeah. So, um, Banks, financial institutions, they're going to demand of you big, big business plans. I do not believe that the 25-year, 30-year, 500-page business plan is any way a necessity. Mm -hmm. I do believe, I mean, I believe in the power of, I think any business needs to have total clarity on what they want to create. They need to have total clarity on the problems they're going to solve and how they're going to solve them better than anyone else in their industry. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take 500 pages to write that down. Mm -hmm. But they do need a clear vision of where they're going. And I, I'm a big believer of one-page business maps, yep. which summarizes the key things. Who are you looking to work with? How are you going to make a difference? How are you going to reach those people? How are you going to create a lasting relationship with those individuals or those customers? Yep. And, 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 and it's keeping it simple because complexity is the enemy of execution. And I can tell you that from my own experience, you know, from those first few steps out of corporate and into, into entrepreneurship. That's so awesome. to answer your question, absolutely. I think those massive... Business plans are a little crazy, but it is important to know where you're going and have certain key aspects within that plan. And also to have an idea of the numbers. You know, there's lots of different stories I can tell you of mistakes I've made by not knowing my numbers mm. since I started. But that's, a, that's an important component. Yeah, there's two things that I learned early on in my career. And that was one, business is, is, speaks in the language of numbers. And the other thing is businesses use contracts. That was a big aha for me. At the time, yes. you're like, we don't do contracts. I'm a good <laughs> Let's shake our hand. No, no, no. Businesses use contracts. And it's not because of any fault of anyone. It's just to make sure that everyone's hearing what everyone else is saying. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm very much on par with you, which is great. Now, to bring it back to what you're saying, you know, it's the, two dif uh, the difference between these two businesses. What was the difference? Why was one being successful in the, uh, in the, in the recession and the other one floundering? That's a very good question. So number one, and believe it or not, most people would probably think it's something to do with marketing, which is, is number two. But number one is leadership. Hmm. It's leadership. And whether you have a team or you don't have a team, the reason there was a big difference between these two specific entrepreneurs is one was willing to take risks in the face of adversity. Mm. And, and the one who was willing to take risks in the face of act adversity was the one who was winning. Mm. Where, whereas the other gentleman, sadly, continued to persist to do the same things in the same way in a different territory because out of fear. You know, it was, all he, mm. you, know you look at the headlines from those, the, that period and you know, you know your business is going under because that's what the media is telling you. Mm. But you have, to, you have to adapt. So the, the number one was leadership. The guy who was winning, the guy who was thriving, was adaptive. He was responsive. He made changes. He took risks. Hmm. He, he adapted to the terrain. You know, he, he kept the same business model, but he adapted to the terrain. Whereas the other guy, he let fear cripple his business. And, you know, I literally hmm. saw that business go out of business. Um, so number one is, is, is leadership. And leadership is how boldly you can stick towards your vision. And I guess that's a lot of what the Unstoppable brand is all about. It's about helping people have those bold decisions when it's, when it's important, it's crunch time. Uh -huh. And the, the second, the second was marketing. And again, change your, when, when times are changing, you need to be willing to change your approach. You know, if you think about the explosion of social media during that time period through the recessionary uh -huh. times, 
the game changed. You have to be willing to look at how the, the market is changing in terms of how you can reach your end customer. And if the customer's behaviors are changing, you have to notice that. You have to, you have to understand how your customers are operating and how they're now looking for information about your products or services. And again, the business who was thriving in that situation had really got a handle on social media, the latest uh, strategies when it came to uh, marketing his business, whereas the other guy was still trapped in that fear and not looking at other ways that he could market himself. That's awesome. Okay. So those are two big ones. Is there anything else? Marketing, leadership? Those In, in that moment, those the, those two guys, those were the two things. The two things, which is yeah, fine. Yeah. I mean, that speaks volumes right there. Um, just like you said, I mean, they both kind of feed off each other. I think, I mean, I'm a marketer, so obviously I'm biased, but I think that marketing is about leadership because you can't be timid. You know, marketing is about how, approaching your work as if, you know, for example, you lost your family pet and you wanted to get it back and you need to find out if there's anybody out there know, you're trying to find, does anybody know where this dog is? Well, does, hey, does anybody have this problem? Does anybody need this? solution you know or just even the same thing like if you had a cure for arthritis and you knew it was a cure and you knew you could change people's lives and help them and I think that's like for me and again I'm a little bit biased but I, I take that to my marketing where that leadership role in the sense of where you you know like you're not timid you're not shy you're not hiding in your shell even if you're an introvert you got to you know, like you said boldly stick to your vision of helping these people so no those are two great ones I think there's a lot <laughs> like a lot of value in those in and of themselves now, you've mentioned you've had your own struggles in entrepreneurship as you've gone. What have been some of your biggest challenges in your, in your career? Well, so firstly, um, that moment when I handed in my notice, that was a, an exciting time, uh, an intimidating time. You know, you're stepping out into the unknown. And what I discovered initially was that life as an entrepreneur is very different. Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, so I'd always had a team around me, often hundreds of people, and now I was on my own, and it, I became very quickly entirely overwhelmed, you yeah. know, because I became distracted by all the noise in the marketplace, jumped from pillar to post, trying to find the right business model for my vision, and over the course of several months, having left my safe and comfortable corporate career behind, I went from being this uh, successful uh, corporate employee to being this broke wannabe entrepreneur, having tried all these different business models and getting nowhere, spinning my wheels dabbling in business models and you know i'd saved up this amount of cash which was going to be my kind of safety fund and that just dwindled in no time because i didn't <laughs> have true clarity on how i was going to run my business mm, that's those are big those are big challenges and a big big wake-up call and a big learning experience too that's crazy so how did you overcome those what did you do that's a good question now so those that situation that inertia that procrastination that classic case of delving into the situation where you're trying to learn everything before taking action, those are all symptoms of fear and a lack of self-worth. So I got to a point, you know, you get, to, you get to a point when your bank balance is so low and you go to the gym and you put your pin code in to get in the front door of the gym and you can't, you can't get in there. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of wake up call. Mm -hmm. Now I was willing to take the risks and I always had this, I had this attitude inside of me that uh, as long as my heart still beats and my brain still works, then I'll find a way. You yeah. know, there's, I, before I even quit the position at the corporate position, I'd evaluated what's the absolute worst case scenario. What, right. what, what's the worst that could happen? And fortunately, I've always had a, a great set of friends, a great family. You know, even if I stuffed up majorly, I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be end up on the street, you know, so I was willing to take risks. Mm -hmm. But to turn it around, you know, in those moments when I'd hit rock bottom financially, it was a case of I had to take a deep look at myself and say, what is going on here? I had to take a look in the mirror and see who was looking back at me. Ooh. And uh, I, I realized that, you know, the problem, the problem wasn't what I was doing. It was the problem was inside of me. And I had this fear of failure. I had this low self-worth. I had lack of self-belief. Hmm. And I had to really go to work. And these things, you kind of protected from them in the corporate world because you know, yeah, you're like sheltered sheltered it's like the time warp and then all of a sudden you're exposed to this great outdoors it's like it's like a plane drops you off in the arctic all of a sudden you've got the elements you yeah. know? And, <laughs> yeah. and that's that's the kind of experience i had and so i had to do some pretty deep inner work to get over those things because you know they're, they're not permanent challenges it's not like no. it's not like a physical affliction it's just an inner it's an inner uh piece of work that you need to do to get through and and sometimes it's not even self-inflicted. Sometimes it's just your parent telling you over and over that you're not good enough or, you know, or them pushing their false beliefs on you. There's a lot of, um, a lot of BS that you got to like dig at and chisel out of your head because like you said, you know, you, I feel like business is very Shakespearean and that, um, 
you know, businesses and people fall victim to their greatest weaknesses, I think. Because in Shakespeare, all of his works, his, his main characters fell victim to their, their character flaws. And I think business is the same way. So that's, that's actually very mature, very profound that you actually did that in the beginning. Because that's, I think, what holds a lot of businesses back, probably even mine. It's the owner getting in the way with some sort of BS they have up in their head that they haven't resolved. Absolutely. It comes back to the previous point we were talking about where it's the leader. It's always the leader who's standing at the front of the business who's either driving it forward or holding it back. Yeah. And I was the one holding it back. Yeah. Um, uh, so um, the first step was awareness. I had to look in the mirror um, and look at what the truth was. The, question, the, the reality is when you actually write this stuff down and uh, you, you analyze what's going on in, your, in, in, in the inner game, you almost start to feel a bit embarrassed that you've been held back by those thoughts. You thought, how did that happen? This, yeah. is, this isn't who I am. And I had to start reconfiguring what the truth is about myself hmm. you know, and claim my true identity. Because I, when, I, when I look at the leader of a business, I think, what is the identity of that business owner? And this was something I, I, had to, I, I leaned upon for my old corporate career. Because when I was progressing in the corporate career, I was thinking, right, if I want to get to the next stage, what skills or attitudes... What do I need to embody to reach that next level? And all that came back to me. I was like, right, who do I need to become as an entrepreneur? What is the identity I need to, 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 to embody to enable me to get out of this rut and step forward and make my business happen? Mm, that's a good one. That's a writer downer. What skills and attitudes do you need to reach your next level? That's a great one. So that was the next step in terms of figuring out who I wanted to become and you know, you hear it, you hear it, but if you listen to any personal development work, it's always about who, who you become. And it doesn't really become apparent until you put yourself in the shoes yeah. uh, in that moment you know, and actually really experience it hands on when you're at that crux moment where you have to make a change. Then you really understand what it means to find out who you need to become. Mm, wow. uh, and that, that was really powerful. Then, then step three, really, in terms of transformation was was getting outside mentors. And that, that's been probably the single most powerful um, part of the p puzzle really in terms of the puzzle of transformation because there's other people out there and you know in, in those moments when I was hitting broke and I was questioning everything about myself as an entrepreneur yeah. I realized you know as I, I started to connect with other people is I'm not alone I'm not the only one that is suffering this situation yeah. and, and and since growing my business since that time in 2012 it's it's a huge problem it's a massive prevailing issue and it's something it holds people back from starting. It holds people back from reaching the levels they're capable of. And it, and, it, and it holds people back from their greatness. There's people out there doing good things, but they could be doing great or extraordinary things. So you could listen to this thinking, okay, it's a, it's a challenge getting started. But it's believe me, it's way beyond that. It's a challenge that stops people from reaching the levels that they could possibly experience in their lifetime and creating what they're born to do. Mm. It's, it's, just, it's the same thing. It's the same question that you, you said. You know, it's what, what skills, attitudes, and values and identity do I need to – to, to, to embody in order to reach that next level. And it's, it's a question that not everyone asks themselves. But finding the mentors was the next stage in terms of uh, to, to integrate that change. And that's a really, really powerful point. And I think it's a really good lesson only because, I th you know, you mentioned this and I think this is good to, to bring up as well. Like you didn't know other people were in the same position you were in because when you're a business owner, it's kind of a lonely place to be because... Uh, your friends and family don't get you, right? The people around you don't understand you. They don't see your vision. There was a great, I'm not, I'm not much, I'm a spiritual person. I'm not I'm religious, but there's a great quote. And I saw it on a t-shirt. It was like, don't expect others to understand your grind when God didn't give them your vision. And I think that, you know, even though mm -hmm. I'm not, that's really powerful to me because I'm like, that makes so, explains so much of like what I've done in my life. People are like, what are you doing? Like, they don't see what you see. So, um, Anyways, I think that that's an important one. Um, and that, so you can't go turn to your competitors and be like, hey, you know, sales are <laughs> down this month. What, do you, what are you guys doing? And then you can't, your friends and family don't understand you. So you really do need a mentor and you need to be part of some sort of community. You need some way to latch in and surround yourself with people because otherwise your, your self-doubt, your, that negative self-talk can eat you. It'll eat your soul. Like, and it's not that you're a bad person or you're wrong or those things are right. It's like something that we, I don't know why, but just part of being human um, you know, uh, just, you know, you know what I mean? Like, it's just a part Absolutely. of like the life experience for whatever reason. Um, so well, here's another interesting thing on that point. Now I, the, I predominantly work with digital, digital entrepreneurs, online entrepreneurs who have a real focus on creating their work through the online space. And what that tends to lead to is a bunch of people working from home by themselves, uh -huh. Uh, in a very confined environment. And they've done studies on people's self-worth and self-belief. And there's a real strong correlation between the amount of time you spend alone and your level of self-belief 
so if you spend a lot of time by yourself and you're feeling that your self-belief is lacking, then I would suggest you want to find a way to engage with more people more frequently, physically, not just on Skype and on the on Zoom or whatever tools you use to connect with other human beings. Mm. But there's a real strong correlation between your value of yourself and the amount of time you spend with other people. You know, that's I'm really glad you brought that up. I actually never knew that stat or heard that, but that's uh, a buddy of mine, maybe you might even be listening, Stuart, lives in the same town I'm in. And, you know, he rents a little office space. It's like a shared office space, and it costs him like 300 bucks a month. But when he goes there, there's like a shared boardroom. There's a shared coffee room. There's like he's got, you know, and there's all these other entrepreneurs that he gets to hang out with all day. And so he can go to his door, his little office, shut the door, you know, and and be alone and do his work. But at the same time, he can go and socialize whenever he wants to. And I I remember I was like, that was great because that's something that, like I said, I never heard that stat, but I know that I've taken a ton of steps because, I mean, you and I both running podcasts. Like that's not something you do you know, in a food court at a mall. Right. So, um, right. So I think that that's a really good tip. Yeah. You have to, and I think that also speaks to having a solid like daily routine for people, I think is also part of that where you, you do get some socialization and you get outside every day, you know, whether you're counting steps or whatever, I think that's a really, really, really good tip. It's part of why I love CrossFit so much. A little bit of a plug for that because I love doing the morning class because I go in the morning, I do the 6.30 a.m. class. We almost always start with some sort of group team activity for a warm-up, some sort of two-person, three-person group, whatever activity you get a good workout in. So it's like I get my exercise, I socialize, get outdoors. It's a great way to start the day because I, when you said that, I could definitely relate to a period in my life where I was an entrepreneur and I spent maybe two, three months working from home and it yeah we just talked about how it'll, it'll eat you and obviously now thank goodness i've i've come up with things to combat that but i think that's a real danger i think that you know we've kind of danced around a little bit but you you also said it before that often businesses are either fueled by or limited by the 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 leader of the company so anyone that's listening to this you need to know, maybe take a second and think about what's holding you back you know, is any of this ringing true for you? If so, what can you do in the next 24 hours to illuminate that block and move past it? Because I think that, like you said, the business graveyard is littered with world-class products and services. And so we need to help as many people as we can overcome themselves to really help people out in the world. So um, that's a great tip for anyone that's starting out and struggling. I want to know, um, do you feel that there's any habits you brought up some great things. You brought up working with a team. You brought up leadership and marketing. You talked about claiming your true identity and working on yourself, your skills and your attitudes. You talked about getting mentors. You've talked about a lot of really, really foundational things that entrepreneurs need to have in their arsenal or be aware of or be working on. Do you feel that there's any particular habits that you've had that have helped you on your path to success? Big time. Now, this, you you, you were touched on it really with morning routine. I had my mastermind call this morning, and one of the one of the guys asked me, um, one of the girls, sorry, she said, um, "How do you keep so freaking motivated?" Right. And I, I said, "Well, one of the things is having a powerful morning routine. Have and to have a morning routine. Yeah. Have to have a morning routine. So you know, I'm up by up by six a.m. every morning. The first thing I do is hydrate. I take a yep. stretch, make sure my body's flexible. Hit the gym. Come back, meditate, cold shower." Every single day, I'm reading my vision statement, my mission statement, my 90-day goals, my one-year goals, really driving those messages into my mind. And also, you know, we've talked about those things about becoming a certain identity as an entrepreneur. I have a list of uh, skills and habits and um, elements of my personality that I want to gr- grow and enhance. And that's something I do every single morning. And then the end of every day, I have an evening routine where I evaluate, did I live up to those expectations that I set of myself and where am I falling short? So those two habits have been hugely transformational because I still, I still, despite what I've said, I still spend a lot of time working alone. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, I had to find ways to get around that. And that morning routine has been a really powerful thing. Yeah. But also having someone who holds you accountable. Now, I have a, mm. daily accountable, a daily accountability call as part of my daily morning routine where we spend 15 minutes recapping the previous day. Are we on track with what we said we we're going to do? And then isolating any roadblocks that's stopping you from doing what you should be doing. So... Those things are really, really powerful. That particular habit, having a morning routine, having accountability calls, someone who understands your business and understands your vision and someone who's willing to, to, to give you a kick in the ass when you need it. 
Mm, mm. I love that. Yeah, yeah. I just, yeah, I, I almost just want to repeat everything you said to make sure everyone here was listening to that. Um, that's a great one. Again, people listen to this. If if you feel there's too much info or you're driving, you might not have a chance to take notes, like, like listen to this interview again because there's some great cornerstone things here that will be like make or break the difference of your day. I notice I have a... I, I think there's an exponential ROI on if I have my morning routine or not. Days I don't have my morning routine, um, I just don't think you start the day as well. I think that's such a key. And uh, there's probably some people listening to this that are like, yeah, but I'm not a morning person. First of all, one thing I want to say about this is not, you know, I don't know if the morning routine is for everyone, but you know, it's for a large part of people. And those who say they're not morning people, it's just because you don't like, it's like a new habit. You know, it's like, it's like, it's awkward. It's clunky. Your body's not used to it. You know, because I I find that if I do the workout in the afternoon versus in the morning, I actually perform worse in the afternoon because my body is like yearning for that. And because I've gotten conditioned to it right now. So, um, Anyways, I, mean, I just want to say that because I know there's some people that they're great entrepreneurs, but they're like night owls. You just have to know yourself and your energy, but you really do need to start your day on the right foot. Sorry, go ahead. I mean, that's 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 really that, that was part of the discussion that came from the masterminds. I'm not a morning person. I said, well, just take the word morning out of routine, call it a daily routine. Yeah. The key, the key, and I I do a lot of work when it comes to managing my energy. I pride myself on my yeah. energy levels. I've studied it exponentially. I want to have more energy than anyone else so that I can create what I want to create. And so if, you, if you're not a morning person, you know, I've read loads of studies on sleep and there's no conclusive evidence, but the, the majority of them will say seven to eight hours sleep a day, a night, sorry, is what you need. So if you, if you take your seven hours and just work backwards and say, what time do I get up? Well, just give yourself the gift of that time in the morning to get yourself prepped for the day. Uh-huh. And it is a gift for yourself. And then if you top yourself up in the morning, it gives you more to fuel the rest of your day. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what time you get up. I know, I know plenty of entrepreneurs who go to bed at four in the morning and get up at, you know, 10, 11, uh, 10, 11 the next day, you know, yeah. that's fine. But yeah. they still give them that time in the morning to get started. Yep. 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 No, I think that's really important. You know, it's like measure twice, cut once. Like you really need to just get yourself, your body, your mind, everything prepared as you can. I think when you're younger, you know, you can kind of get away with it, you know, because you've got that extra energy in that. But, um, I think just as you get older, the habits that you create, I mean, it's, it's really important. It's so, it's like, it's make or break in a lot of instances. Now, you've mentioned something about energy. I would love to know what some tips or tricks that you talk about for, for high energy. Like, how, when you say you want to have more energy than everyone else, does that mean you just want to eat, like, the best diet? Do you take ginseng every day? Like, what does that mean for you? Um, so the meaning of having energy, really, to start with that, is, um, you know, again, it comes to leadership. If you've got a big vision, you're going to need a big amount of energy to fulfill that. Um so firstly, I decided that's going to be, I'm going to place that as a foundation to build everything else upon. Because if I'm feeling good, then the things I will do will be good. So I made the distinction that I have to feel good to start my day. So energy is going to be a, a critical component of that. And there's some steps that I take. So, of course, the morning routine is one, uh, working out, you know, um, and I've done plenty of studies on t- the types of workouts that will create more energy than others. And it basically just comes down to a hybrid of using strength-based workouts, uh, cardio-based workouts, and endurance-based workouts. There's no strict formula. Um, so working out is a critical component. But then, yep, fueling my body with nutritious f- foods. Um, I eliminate all sugar. Uh, I don't have dairy. Um, I juice every morning. Um, I use mm. plant-based protein as recovery. I don't use whey protein. And... You know, I'm sure there's other people listening to the show, probably in the fitness industry, will come to attack all the principles. But it's it's working pretty well for me having a pr- pretty um, high plant based diet. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think I think those are two critical components because uh, I remember there's an equation. It's like the Arabic equation for wealth, and it's a million, like one zero 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 zero, and it's like. Uh, each each placeholder represents something. So it's like the first one is your health, and the next is like mansions and or businesses and mansions and cars, and it like goes all the way down to like what you own, and that's like your worth. But the thing is, is if you don't have your health, everything's a bunch of zeros. So um, that's really 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 important. And I think that yeah, working out, no sugar, plant based protein, uh, veggie juice, those are all really good ones. Energy is super 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 important. Now, what about the team stuff? I want to ask you a bit about team stuff because I've I've, I've I'm a writer downer, so I keep paper notes, and I've written this down like three times. Like, ask me about team, ask me about team, because mm-hmm. you mentioned that you've worked with teams a lot and you had hundreds of people. Do you have like any guiding principles to help anyone who's maybe struggling, or they've got a team, or you know they're just not used to managing a team? Like, what would you, 
what would you say to yourself the first time? Like, what advice would you give yourself, you know, back when you had to manage your first team for some important task? The number one thing is to see the world how your team see it. Hmm. Not to see the world how you see it. You have to understand how they think, how they see the world. If you're trying to influence them from the way you see the world, then you may be ready to cause some conflict. And the challenge is when you build teams, a lot of people try and build teams of people who are just like them. Mm. Then you'll never, you'll never get the perspective of all those different personality types who can add real value. And, you know, like yourself, having interviewed loads of people on the podcast, mm -hmm. often when it comes to entrepreneurship, the primary leader of the, entrepre the entrepreneurial venture is that visionary. They're that typical go-getter entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And the most successful businesses out there will have an integrator as the number two. Yes. If, you, if you look at Apple, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, yep. you know that every great business has the visionary leader and then the integrator who works alongside them. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but you wouldn't find that integrator if you hired people who are just like you. You just have a bunch of other highly excitable visionary people. So when it comes to brainstorming your ideas and then making the rubber hit the road, you'll find that everyone's still in high high level visionary thinking and no one's getting the, the ship on the uh, out to the water. So mm. Um, number one is to see the, see the world how your team see it, but then it's also number two is to, to hire people who are uh, – some have to be complementary to you, but then have other people who can fulfill a very different role to what you fulfill. Mm, and just a tip to add to that for anyone, this is an, an expensive lesson that I keep – I don't know why. Uh, Dan, I don't know why. I don't, I don't know why. I keep having to learn this one, but there's a great quote, and it's like, if you think hiring an expert is expensive, wait until you pay for an amateur. And I think that's an important thing to mention the team here is that when you want to build a team, build the right team. Don't just meet a budget, you know, because, um, you know, the wrong wrong hire can cost tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars because you've onboarded them and now you have to unboard them. And, you know, and just you have to like they get wrapped up into things. You have to unwrap them. So always just go for the best person. Why not the best? Why not get the best people for your team? Why not get the best tools for what you're trying to do? You know, sometimes I've just been bit in the butt so hard and it's almost always been because I was trying to penny pinch and I, I stopped focusing on just getting the best fit for the job type thing so just as a tip to that because um, I think that you know all a company is, is a collection of people working towards a common goal so I think what you said there is really important having um, you know like you said there's always a visionary leader but you need to someone to rein that in and translate it and organize it mentor of mine told me that every company to be successful needs three people you need a product person you need an operations and finance person and you need a marketing person and the same person cannot be in all three of those roles because you, if you have specialized knowledge you know you're jack you know master of one type thing and you really want that and that's kind of what you're emphasizing usually the the product person is kind of the entrepreneur the visionary and then you need an operations person to keep the reins together and then you need some sort of marketing person to help make sure that your message is getting out into the world so that is great. That's really, really good. I would say the same in principle when you talk about getting the best really applies to the systems as well. That's, a, that's an expensive lesson I've learned in my business. And I think one of the challenges is if you've got listeners who are just kind of starting out or just growing their business, they're trying to bootstrap. So they'll cut corners on the cost when it comes to hiring. And the, wor the worst part is trying to do everything yourself. So mm -hmm. I understand that you have to bootstrap and there's, there's cost restraints, but the sooner you can get to a position where you can hire someone else to work with you to take the work off you that's not your zone of genius, that's, that's going to be a major win. But the second step is with the systems. I remember investing in a number of distant, uh, different systems for my business, um, and I had that bootstrap mentality when I first started. And they've all become legacy systems. You know, there's no support. I can't, I can't use them anymore. So I had to reinvest in new systems to replace those old systems. Hmm. So, so I've really learned over the last few years that the better the system you invest in, the better, you know, the better you'll grow your business. You yeah. want the best, you want the best team and you want the best resources available to you. I understand there's budgets, but sometimes it's worth that stretch just to go the extra mile to get the, the tools and systems that will support your business growth. Yeah, yeah. That's that's such a good key. That's such a good key. And this is actually this came up on a call for myself talking about mastermind calls. There was a call that I had that um, 
guy was complaining about, I don't want to say complaining, but he was in this trap of how do I like, okay, like I'm up and running, I'm making money, but I'm, I'm kind of everything in my business. And he didn't really get how do I, like, he didn't understand how does he grow his team? How does he free up his time? How does he do that stuff? And for anyone who's listening to this, I think a, an, at least my advice to him, an easy place to start is because in this guy's scenario, he kind of had like a bit of an agency model where he does like everything. Like, oh, I can do your social media. I can do your web building. I can do your email market. Like, I, I do everything. But what I, you know, most people have an 80 20. And so I think where the value would really be is trying to figure out, like you said at the very beginning, keep it simple. And so try to boil it down. My advice to him was to figure out what is a standard service offering that you can sell. Maybe you do these other fringe things, but what's like the 80 20 for you and your business? And can you standardize that? Because if you can standardize it, then you can make training for it. And then you can hire someone to do that to replace yourself. And then you can move on to doing bigger, better things. Um, I don't want to say better, but you can move on to doing something else, right? Focusing on a different component of the business. And yes. I think that that's a really key thing too. For anyone that's listening, I know that at least myself when I was starting out, even now, like hiring people, it's always like, ah, oh, I'm going to make this money and is this the right person? Do I really want to give them this much money a month? And maybe I don't know if that's not, I don't know, PC, politically correct to say, but I think a lot of times it is. I'm like, I'm taking this money out of my pocket to pay this person. What am I paying them for? You know, was mm. it going to be worth it? Am I just spending money to spend money? Um, and I think that that is, makes it easy. Either they're in a role to support something that needs to get done or they're in an income role. Um, you've got like a traffic team and a conversion team and a client experience team. And so, you know, the conversion team are all your sales tools or your sales mechanisms, your webinars or your sales reps or whatever. Your traffic team are the people that are getting your publicity and all that PR and syndicating your content and making sure your podcast is on every directory and yada, yada, yada. You know, you've got the traffic team, social media manager, conversion team, but they need someone that's really there for the client experience. And so if you're trying to build it, your team and grow and you're like, how do I do that? Or what's a good way to do it? Like I said, try to break off little standardized pieces of things because one of the worst things that you can do is hire someone and they just kind of float around which isn't necessarily terrible but then they just kind of find a home and that's comfortable but you're not really sure what they're accountable for mm -hmm. you know you're paying them and like you, you know everyone's working together on the same project but it's not as clear cut and I don't think it'll ever be clear cut but at least if you're intentionally hiring someone uh, especially in the early stages, you know, just make sure they're either helping make more sales, they're helping bring more traffic, more leads, or, you know, they're, they're taking off a very specific piece of the fulfillment stuff and the client experience stuff and something that, like you mentioned, systems. All a system is, is a checklist. It's a workflow process, right? Step one, step two, step three, step four. Um, and you just have to have it well documented and laid out and... Anyways, sorry, I went on a bit of a rant there, but that was, it was because it was really pertinent, and I think for a lot yeah, of people... Yeah, it's a really strong point. Well, because you mentioned leaving a corporate job, and I know that there's probably some people that, you know, that's why they resonate from you, is they're in a position where they, you know, there's a lot of people listening to this who maybe are in a corporate job that want to get out, and it's like, well, how do I do that, and how do I do this without, you know, without having to uh, abandon my work because I'm not making enough... I'm not making enough yet to leave my job. Well, then stop doing fulfillment of the work. Find someone who can do that and just keep them busy. You know what I mean? And then, you know, and, and then and then just build slowly that way. Does that make sense That's, at all? Yeah, it does. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the interesting thing is, you know, there's there's two routes out of corporate, really. You can either just cut loose and, and yeah. go for it or, you you know, you, you build on the side. Yeah. Uh, and there's pros and cons to both. I was I was the guy who cut loose and jumped jumped ship and yeah. Well, it's, if you uh, can do it, that's the way to go. Because they say you know if you treat your business like a hobby, it'll pay you like a hobby. If you treat it like a business, it'll you know it'll pay you like a business. And it's really hard to be successful without full time hours invested. You know absolutely. So, um, do you ever feel that something was holding you back? The only thing standing in my way was myself. That was that was the number one thing. Um, there will come times in the journey, you know, I had times in the journey where there was financial constraints where I needed to invest in perhaps more advertising and I didn't have the budgets available. And that's a classic lesson of knowing the numbers, because if you know the numbers of your marketing funnels, then you can predict ahead how much funds you're going to need. Mm -hmm. But but ultimately, I, I, I personally believe that anyone who has any struggles needs to go within. The problem is rarely the strategies. It's the state that you're in. It's the way you're thinking. Mm. And there's, you know, the classic line of, you know, there's never a lack of resources. It's always a lack of resourcefulness. It's always the man in the mirror or the woman in the mirror that's causing the block. And it was only ever myself. I'm, I'm the only the only chokehold on the business is me. Mm, mm. 
I, you know, I'm the single most important factor in the business in my growth, and I'm the single most important factor in disabling my business. Uh, you, you choose what you, you have to choose your gears. And is that what you've been working through with your mentor? Or did you work through that mostly on your own, or were you like going to see like a counselor or to call in like you know, like I'm and I'm just asking sincerely, like if someone's listening to this because I know I have my own BS that's in my own way. So how did you work through it to achieve what you've accomplished so far? Was it, yeah. I already asked, so I don't need to repeat it again. <laughs> so you know, I, I'm a, I'm an avid avid fan of um, listening to uh, personal growth and self development work. Um, that's really really powerful. The fir- the first thing is you know when when it, when it comes to guys, guys are you know there's masculine. The masculine man is very. Um, they're often intimidated to actually expose any flaws or chinks in their armor mm-hmm. you'll, you'll find that women the feminine women will speak more openly about the challenges they're facing and they have that unique ability to mm-hmm. kind of discuss those uh, chinks in their armor with their fellow female friends whereas guys tend to hold it back and i think my personal view is that the truly fearless man is the man who is able to experience every emotion and at the scale and every facet of their being they're able to share and uh, unfold and i think that the limit to anyone's growth is dictated by how deep they're willing to go within themselves to find what it is that holds them back hmm. so i used a combination of um you know personal development tools to understand more about how the mind works and what causes things like fear limiting beliefs self-doubt and to really get a firm grip on what those things are and how they work mm-hmm. obviously worked with mentors to get it to, to really shine a light on it and understand because you know a really truly open mentor will openly share the path they've been on and if you you work with someone who will tell you the full truth of their journey you will uncover that there are all of those chinks in their journey too so they can not only help you with the strategies but they can help you with that inner game piece as well mm. and then the final piece is with deep deep inner work and the most transformational thing for me, really, truly, has been two things. One has been c- completing a daily journal. Mm-hmm. I, I do what I call a stream of consciousness journal, okay. uh, where I literally write down, Dan, what's on your mind? No other questions. And I will write, um, and I'll let my mind... This, I'll do this first thing in the morning, and whatever comes up, I will d- dive deeper into. And this, was, this has been, early on in my career, this has been so, so powerful to really get an understanding of what's going on in my brain, because... Fear, self-doubt, and self-worth, all these things show up in a number of different ways. It's the language you use. It's the behaviors that you adopt. It's the actions that you take or don't take hmm. in your thoughts. And you can really, through the stream, conscious, stream of consciousness journaling process, really understand all the facets that are holding you back. Um, and then the second part of that really is um, through the podcast itself, you know, this, this, this chronicling that journey and sharing my own challenges and frustrations and being open about the, the story of, uh, of my journey of transformation has been really kind of cathartic. And it's, it's a release of letting go of those things because it's all been kind of looking back. You know, this, a lot of this journey I went on was like three years ago, 24 right. months, 36 months ago. So um, to look back, it's kind of a release when you finally let go and you can start to see a different pathway then once you do that. So those have been two of the most transformational things for me. That's awesome. And that's huge because I, I really like what you said, just a stream of consciousness. Because, you know, we don't often, if we didn't have mirrors, you never even know if there was a booger on your face, right? So, um, or a phone that could do, take a selfie. So, like that, that looking at yourself, no one can see you how you see yourself. One of the most powerful eye opening exercises that I had, I had, I got to do, I did a program called Katinovic in Canada where basically kids 17 to 21 get to travel Canada. I spent three months in BC, three months in Alberta, and three months in Quebec with the same group of kids we were 11 one girl had to leave and then we were 10 and one of the activities we did around like the sixth month was we did this whole like relationship thing where it was like a bullseye you had like all these different circles with a small one and getting bigger 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 and you had to place everyone like you were in the center and you had to place everyone how far or close they were to you and then you had green yellow and red and you could shade their circle however you wanted all green or little green little like you know what i mean like a little yellow or a lot of red and it was supposed to represent your relationship with them and their relationship with you type thing and it was such a big eye-opening thing because what we never knew when we did it because we all did it privately is then they collected them and then they put them up on the wall and they showed us all and so suddenly it was just very like because something you know because i didn't want so-and-so to know that maybe i didn't really like him you know but what was really eye-opening was how people saw me and 
And I, th I just think that's such a powerful exercise. And so when you talk about just the, the, the journaling, you just kind of like verbal di or mental diary onto the page, and then you can actually look at it, reflect it, and be like, wow, I'm really blank today. I'm really this today. And it gives you an opportunity to reflect on it and change your trajectory or do something to change your mood. Whereas if you didn't do that, you would constantly be so like tunnel visioned, you would just keep trudging forward in that state of mind. So this is a really good call on like mastering yourself to master the art of business. Maybe I'm going to make that the title of the show or something. <laughs> cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I, to be honest, you know, from, from all the time I spent in that corporate position working with all those on, entrepreneurs and in the three years subsequent, it's always the inner game that dictates how fast a business goes. Mm. You can mask it with as many strategies as you like, but it's always the inner game that's causing the, the result on the outside, whether that's causing you to go fast or it's causing you to go slow. There's always something on the inside that's that's causing that chokehold and that's why you know when you ask the question at the beginning what those two factors it's it's all the, the two primary factors in the success of any business the strength of the leader mm. and the, the the capacity of the marketing mm, 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 mm. yeah so well said um so what do you feel is the future like where is this industry going where do you see the future of your industry of podcasting and of coaching and consulting and where do you see that going like five ten years from now I think that's a great question. There's so many, there's so many new platforms becoming available and principles never change. So if you look at the principles of coaching or the principles of business, they rarely change. However, the, the way that we use these different channels do. So, you know, you have different opportunities now with live streaming video and that's only going to expand. It's only going to expand and, and grow. So I think things like live videos just the other day um, on my newsfeed, someone was doing a live um, hit class, uh, an exercise workout class on their on their live Facebook timeline as a, as a tool to, to attract new clients. I thought that was fantastic. So all of these new channels and uh, technologies are going to make things so, so simple for us. You know, right now to use Facebook Live, you stream it from your mobile, but wait until you can start using professional quality equipment. Imagine the kind of mm -hmm. things that you can do then in terms of creating that live TV environment reaching a global audience. So I think the, the platforms we have available to us are, are going to be a key component and mastering those key channels is going to be a real critical performance indicator for many different businesses. Mm, so communication and continued advancements in that, being able to reach more people easier and, and basically opening up the living room, taking your living room everywhere and letting people from anywhere in the world come sit down and like this, this is kind of this idea, the whole concept of this podcast, sit by the fireside and talk to some of my more successful friends, find out what they did. And so hopefully it would help an earlier version of me if they happen to listen into the interview. So. Yeah, you know, the interesting thing about podcasting as well is that if you look at a podcast compared to a, a traditional radio show, there's still loads of stuff that people have done on radio that's not being done on on podcasts. You rarely hear like simple things like panel discussions on a podcast. Mm -hmm. They're out there, but that's such a simple thing that, that will grow over time mm -hmm, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. because it's, it's, it's a new medium still relatively so we're still kind of exploring the power of podcasting but we still need to look at what's what's come before us and see some of the things that have been great you know I, at the moment i'm studying people like oprah to understand how power the, the power of her questioning so that i can improve my interview mm -hmm. skills and those kind of stuff mm. so there's all these things we can lean on from traditional media which will help us accelerate the growth of, of the new digital medias you know that's a really important um, statement that you said there just because not only can you from the past like we're all little was it we're all simply little bits of history repeating but also the fact that you know all these technological advancements social media all that stuff like social media is a new tool but all it is is just an ex it's an extension of ourselves it's an extension of your existing social like capacity like if you're if you're a douchebag in real life you're just going to be a bigger douchebag on social media it gives you the ability you know what i mean it's almost like they say like money like money doesn't really change people it just it makes them uh, bigger than life in that sense so if you're a great person you get a lot of money then obviously you're going to do great things with your money if you're you know what if you're really selfish you're going to do really like it's just it's just an amplifier and so i think it's the same thing like you talk about having these li like live videos I think some people, they're going to really, and it comes back to that inner working, that working on the business and the systems and the team and the leadership and the marketing in the sense of you have live video capacity, but if you never use it anyways to begin with it, if you don't do anything live with your audience, do you know what I mean? Like if you don't have that in your business already, if you sell via direct mail, live video is not going to help you at all. But that being said, if you do do that, if you do face-to-face -face presentations, if you do workshops with people, if you do coaching or classes, if you're a teacher in any way, that has huge implications, huge ramifications on your ability to reach more people. So 
Anyway, sorry, you just got my own wheels going about that because I, I was reading something about Elon Musk yesterday saying we're all kind of already cyborgs. Like, you know, like everyone's kind of afraid of this big future of that, but we kind of already do it. Like, you know, like we're humans and we, we use tools to perform tasks and we've been doing that ever since we first, you know, used a rock to smash stuff. Like, so just because I've got all these tools, it doesn't mean, you know, I'm any less human. It just means I'm a, I'm a better version of, of, you know what I mean? I'm able to do more with my brain essentially. So absolutely. anyways, I digress. I know I'm on a bit of a tangent there. Um, Dan, is there anything that I didn't ask you that I should have asked you? I want to make sure I'll give you a forum before I go on. Do you know what? I think that one question would be, is there anything that you regret? Because one of the biggest lessons I've learned over the last few months, this is recent, is that I do no longer, I no longer believe that there is any mistakes. Mm. And everything, every struggle that I went through when I first left my corporate career, whether it was that inner struggle or that financial struggle, if that hadn't happened, then I, it wouldn't have led me to where I am today. And that it created the foundation upon which to create the unstoppable brand for me. And it's enabled me to find my true mission to, to, and to be able to discover and share the answer to that question, what makes people unstoppable? What makes people unstoppable in business and life? And if I hadn't been through those struggles, I wouldn't be where I am right now. So mm -hmm. I think if you can look at some of those things in your past and think, oh, did I regret that? Well, no, just trust that it was, it, was, it was the right thing to happen. And it's led you exactly to where you are today. And it removes all the negativity from the stuff that you may have looked back upon and thought, I wish I hadn't done that. There's no mistakes. It's led you to where you are right now so that you can do the things that you're capable of right now. Hmm. Yeah, and life is just an adventure anyways. You know, you're Absolutely. born, you die, and we don't, no one really knows what happens at the end of it. Um, Alan Watts is a philosopher, and I love this idea of his. And, it, and, you know, if anyone's here listening to this is either nervous or fearful of the future, uh, hopefully this can kind of take some of the fear out of it. But he's got a great talk on YouTube, Alan Watts. Love him tons of he's a great philosopher and he talks about the dream of life and he talks about like just to suspend your disbelief and just imagine that for whatever reason when you go to bed at night you had the power to dream 75 years of life okay and you know the first thing first like when you discover this you would just you you would you would live and enjoy all sorts of pleasures every pleasure unimaginable you do all your favorite things climb all the highest peaks you'd have the most right 75 years of life every night and so for weeks you would do this and eventually you kind of get bored and then you want okay well now i want something where it's not all sunshine and rainbows or you'd want something where maybe you know you start getting more and more and more risky to now i don't want to know i'm dreaming you know, and if every night you went to bed, you could dream 75 years of life, then realistically over your lifetime, you, had the, you have the potential to dream the life that you're living right now. And so like when you talk about just that, like being willing to step out there to overcome yourself, to enjoy the journey, you know, it's not the destination. I think that's really key. And I think, you know, the, the, the hardest part to be is just that roof and ramen. You know, that's what at least I say, roof and ramen, like shelter and food. Like, can I eat and can I pay my bills and make sure I'm not living on the streets? And once you get that taken care of, you really, it's just, it pays off dividends to take it from a place to take business from a place of, I want to do the best to be the best, to help people overcome the biggest obstacles, you know, that I can help them with. And I think that's just such a phenomenal place to come from in business and a great place to go at it from. And I just, Dan, you've just had such great tips at this call. You've really helped boil down some of the inner game of stuff. I think that if people just listen to this interview a few times and then reflect on themselves and the struggles that they're facing and what they've got going on and what they want to achieve, I, I think this call definitely has the answers for them. So, um, what are you doing now? How do you, how do people get in touch with you? If they've really resonated with this, if they really vibe with it, they want to get in touch and, and follow you or, or get involved with whatever you're doing. What are some of the best ways to reach out? Um, so I have my hub, which is danjgregory.com. That's uh, my primary website. And if you're interested in finding out more about my kind of philosophies about the inner game and the, what it takes to be unstoppable in business and life, then come and tune in to the unstoppable podcast, which you can find on iTunes and Stitcher. Uh, and that does have a URL. There's a www.unstoppablepodcast.com where you can find more information about the show on there as well. That's awesome. Awesome. Dan, thank you so much for coming today. It's been an honor and a pleasure. I know my brain is spinning. I'll be listening to this interview again too. Again, everyone listening, you may want to give this a couple of listens. I certainly hope you had a pen and paper with you, taking down notes. Uh, if you know anyone that would benefit from this call, please feel free to pass it on to them. And just, Dan, I know you could be helping other people. You've got your own following, your own podcast, your own customers, but I really appreciate you coming here to share with me and my audience so that way we could all be a little bit better. So just thank you and all the best to you and your loved ones. It's an honor. Thank you very much, Daryl. You've reached the end of our interview. 
Now, first, let me thank you for listening. I appreciate and respect you more than you'll ever know. And now I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. First, what three lessons did you just learn? What three aha moments just jumped out at you? Second, what can you implement for yourself and your business in the next 24 hours? Third, what can you give to someone else to help you with or give them to just do it for you? Whatever it is, remember taking action is the secret sauce to results. Now, if you think this interview would be helpful for a friend, please give them a link to it. It'll help them and it'll help me too. I'd also like to invite you to help me find out more about the challenges you're facing, your dreams, your goals, and how I can help you overcome what's holding you back. We both do better when we know better, and your success is my success. So please reach out and interact. You can visit our website, bestbusinesscoach.ca for Canada or California, where I'm from and where I'm living. You're welcome to also try out one of our paid programs. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and pretty much every other social media channel you can think of. You should also subscribe to the podcast. And if you're enjoying them, please leave us a nice review. It really helps. That's all for now. Once again, thank you. Take care of yourself. And remember, the world needs the best business you can build. And I believe in you.